it is finally done. My Mendel 9000, 9001, however you want to call it. Uh, this is a printer that I've been working on and putting off finishing for a long, long time. But now it is printing, it's done its first print, which actually looks pretty good. And yeah, in this video, I just want to show you the process of building this modular testing platform of a printer that is less about building the perfect, ideal, cheapest, whatever printer, but more about having something where I can just come in and plonk a new component on and not tear apart a perfectly working printer that is never gonna go back to stock. With this one, this is all built to be modular, replaceable, and, you know, for me, a testing platform. Let's check it out. So yeah, this printer has gone through quite a few revisions to get to this point. Now, roughly, this is based on a Mendel 90 by Nophead, which is uh, actually a precursor to the Prusa i3 designs. I don't, I don't need to show you how that looks like. Uh, the Mendel 90 was like a, a parallel development of the Prusa i3 um, and the Mendel 90. I think the Mendel 90 was a bit older. And yeah, it's just a very simple box frame. One of the core ideas of the Mendel 90 was that you could lay it flat onto either side and work on it like that without having to worry about you know pinching cables or you know breaking something in the process and in fact I do have panels that go around this machine uh, to fully box it in and make it a closed printer but the point of today's video is showing you some of the considerations that went into making this machine a first of all a very robust machine a very modular machine and one that is not going to have mechanical deficits that is going to hold back any of the components I'm gonna be putting onto it for testing. So this is not a printer that was built, again, to be you know, super compact, super optimized for production. This is a machine that I can put new components on. So for example, switching from the Himera to a Titan Plus V6, it's literally four screws. It bolts into this cheese plate on the X-axis here. One comes off, next one goes in, it's all with modular connectors right up there. That's the idea there. I want to be able to put in new hot ends, new heated beds, uh, new motors, new drivers, new electronics, new everything without having to tear apart a printer and ruin that printer in the process. This one is going to be my modular testing platform for the future and it's a printer that I know is capable, robust, and well-built enough to not be a limiting factor for anything that I might put on this. So let's go check out what this printer used to be and what the process was to get it to this state where it is now a, you know, well-working, well-oiled printer that is ready to accept any challenge that I throw at it. At least, you know, that's the idea. Here's what that printer used to look like. It had drag chains, it had a bunch of different hot ends in there, it had a bunch of different beds in there already, and I learned a lot from building this, but of course I also made a lot of mistakes building it. So step number one in this entire process was to rip out all the parts that I thought were not 100% solid, and that meant the entire X and the Z axis assembly. The idea was to give the x-axis as much rigidity as possible by giving it a plate that would move up and down on the z-axis. And of course, when I build a printer that uses flat sheets, I'm gonna use MGN linear carriages. These are some cheap rails that I had left over, but they are still more than good enough for this application. The ones I originally used on the x-axis were a bit too short, so I replaced them with longer ones later. The x-axis uses MGN9 and the z-axis uses MGN12 rails. Mounting these rails as precisely as possible is absolutely key to getting these to run smooth and without binding. But for the z-axis, I did not manage to mount everything as precisely as required. So later on in the build, I actually added in some of these yellow printed elastic bushings that would give the mounting positions just a tiny bit of elasticity, just enough to take up any tolerances in my hand-drilled holes, but not enough to allow the axis to bounce around and potentially introduce some printing artifacts. So you might be saying, hey Tom, why are you using wood to build this printer? Um, because obviously you can see the wood grain pattern on all these flat elements. I actually like that look, but that's not why I'm using it. So if you just have a solid plank or a board of wood, um, that is going to move a lot and shrink and cup and, and just, you know, it's not gonna maintain its dimensional accuracy 
over time. Um, however, this is plywood, this is birch plywood, so it has interlocking layers of wood. So if one tries to shrink this way, the other one is stopping it from doing that. Now there's still the topic of moisture, but because this is all painted and sealed, there's really not a whole lot of moisture that can get in or out of this frame. And so far, I've had this frame for, I think like five years or something, and it is still perfectly straight, at least straight enough to be a 3D printer. This is not a super high precision machine, no 3D printer is, but for this application, it is very much good enough. Now, if you look at the structural properties of wood, of plywood like this, it is actually in line with steel, with solid steel when it comes to rigidity per weight. And it's also got very favorable properties when it comes to thermal expansion. So because we've got heater elements on here, um, I don't want this thing to warp as soon as it gets a slight bit warm. And birch plywood is very, very good in that regard, where it's not gonna cause any issues being paired up with a metal part anywhere on this machine. But of course, the two biggest factors for choosing wood as a frame material is, first of all, it is relatively inexpensive. You get a lot of rigidity for your money. And also it is super easy to work with. You saw me put in these linear rails, just screw them in. Now, of course, that is not the proper way to use these, but that's something that works for a 3D printer. And it is so much easier than working with, I don't know, aluminum sheet or you know building a frame out of aluminum rails and then connecting everything up. That can be quite tedious. And also with wood, because it is you know one homogenous material, it also gives me the flexibility of just moving single components around. Like I can move this motor mount, I can move this uh, Z axis, uh, I can also move this Z-axis lead screw nut around if I ever have to. And you know, it's just planes. I can just move it around anywhere, screw it back in, and it's gonna be perfect like that. However, there is one bit of this printer that is not wood, and that is the base of the bed. So this entire platform is FR4. This is six millimeter thick glass fiber reinforced sheet. It is pretty heavy, but I just didn't wanna use wood right there when it's where it's gonna get all the heat from the heated bed might also be a fire risk, so I did not want to risk that. I might replace it with something else in the future though. By the way, all the printed parts on this machine are either ABS, for I think all the black parts are ABS, and the red parts are all ASA. So I've chosen a styrene-based material just to give me that extra bit of temperature resistance. And of course, if you have a highly temperature resistant material, the screw connections are also not going to creep and loosen over time as much as if you have something like PLA, where as soon as you apply some pressure, the material starts flowing out underneath that screw head. So I hope that clears up why I'm using a wood frame and why I'm actually very happy with it. So let's get back to the conversion. For the Z-axis, I'm using these nut holders that are gonna fit an Egos M5 threaded rod and the matching self-lubricating nuts. Next, it was time to install the drag chains for the X and the Z-axis. And oh boy, did I have some drag chains planned for this. For the drag chains, I'm using some rather big ones made by Egos, and I'm also using the matching Egos cables, which, if Egos's online design tool is correct, should last for several tens of thousands of hours of continuous use. Overall, I can carry way more signals to the tool head than I'm actually gonna need. Um, I think I've designed this for four total complete tool heads. So that is including a stepper motor, thermistor, heater element, cooling fan, and a part cooling fan directly on the hot end. Not that I'd ever need that many signals and power lines, but my thinking was I'd rather add a few cables extra than later on having to replace the entire drag chain and redoing the entire thing, because this seriously was a pain to do already. But let's stick with something a bit more fun, the X-axis belt drive. These are using extra wide HD3M belts, which are a similar profile to GT2, but if you want the larger sizes to get a more rigid belt drive, it is a lot easier to get HD than GT2. The idler block to the left is also the tensioner block and I added some threaded inserts into the wood so that I could really torque it down and make sure it wouldn't slip. The belt end clamp then attaches to the x-axis carriage using just a single screw making it super modular and again easy to replace. 
All that was left to do was to add an extruder and a hot end, which at the time just made sense to use an E3D Titan. The Titan is not the easiest extruder to mount, but if you just have to screw it to a cheese plate like this, an adapter piece is fairly easy to make. I also included a part cooling fan that, again, would allow me to attach modular fan shrouds. Back when I originally designed this, the radial fans you now see everywhere weren't all that popular yet. So this is where we're at today. This thing was really close to printing. In fact, I think I've, I've had it do its first few moves. The only thing that wasn't working yet was the part cooling fan. I think I still needed to set that up correctly um, for the Do It Wi-Fi. But as you can see, the Do It Wi-Fi is not in the printer uh, at this point. I had to take this out because I needed it for another project. So yeah, right now this printer is pretty headless. It's just nothing in the electronics bay. Now, of course, this is designed and built with the intent of being as modular as possible. So grabbing a board, taking it out, putting it back in should be fairly simple. Um, but what I realized is I don't have this stuff labeled particularly well. Um, I've got power in, I've got 12 volts, which is, so this is 24, this is 12 volts. Um, it still needs a bit of work. So yeah, that's gonna be one of the jobs that I'll have to do. So labeling everything is very important for these things where you do remove and replace things. Now, because it's been a while since I've worked on this printer, um, the components that you know you should be using for a machine like this obviously have changed. So this right now has an E3D Titan on there with a stock V6, but of course at this point, if you're using a Titan uh, on a freshly built printer, feels kind of bad. So I'm gonna be using um, a, is this one, this one is still labeled Hermes. Uh, so I'm gonna be using an E3D Himera. Now, the great thing, because I've got this cheese plate on here, is that the mount for the Himera is really simple. Um, I already made this one. As it turns out, you know, the mounting holes that I was trying to use, I can't, so I made this one instead. Uh, this is just ASA printed on the Prusa Mini, and it is literally just, you know, a bunch of holes that screw onto the Himera, like that. Um, there's some recessed M3 bolt holes in there, and then you've got the M4 bolts that bolt this thing straight to the cheese plate on the x-axis. So that should be a really simple conversion. I'm gonna do that next because we do want to get this thing printing. And because the Hemera does have that two-sided uh, mounting hole pattern, we can just use a universal fan shroud that's specific to the Hemera and not to this printer tool head right there. So yeah, let's go ahead and finish this printer and get it working. When installing the Duet, there was one thing I had to do immediately. Yeah, that erase button is not gonna get pressed accidentally again. This is an early version of the Duet 2 Wi-Fi and newer boards actually skip this button entirely since it was way too easy to press accidentally and it just erases your entire printer configuration. Now, when installing the Himera, I actually ran into a very weird issue that I had not seen before. And that is that I plugged in the motor that I knew worked on another printer and it would not spin up. In fact, it was acting as if one of the motor phases was shorted out or not connected at all. So it wouldn't turn, it would just buzz. Now, as it turns out, these stepper motor cables are not cross compatible. There are two different pinouts for these six pin connectors. To me, only one makes sense and the other one has a crossed over cable. When I asked about this on Twitter, it turns out that yes, this is something that a lot of people have run into and if you use the wrong pinout or the wrong cable, then it can destroy your stepper driver. Especially the TI DRV8825s are apparently prone to, you know, not taking it very gently. Now the Trinamic drivers on the Duet do have some fault detection and they reported a ground short, which is not perfectly accurate, but at least they survived without any noticeable damage. From here, it was just a matter of doing a bit of fine tuning on the configuration of the Duet, setting up a slicer profile, and then setting that first layer height correctly so that my prints would stick. And yeah, that didn't turn out too great. With no proper fan shroud on the part cooling fan to direct the air, the part was not getting nearly enough cooling and the nozzle actually got caught on the curled up print. But the fix was pretty easy. I grabbed the Himera fan shroud by Permanube, printed that, and now things should be looking a lot better. And here we are. I'm gonna say this print looks 
very passable for you know a first print with no tuning done to it, just a first set of settings and print parameters that gets a part out. You can still see that there's a bit of curling on the 3D Benchy's bow. I think this fan just isn't powerful enough. And there are some horizontal lines which corresponds to where the layer times change. Uh, also fuzzies. I just need to tune in the retract settings a bit, but overall like this looks very good. And as I said in the basic series, it's all about how you light your parts for them to look good. So I think with this print result, we are ready to do some testing on this printer and I mean testing of different components that I can put on here. Um, like you saw earlier, it was really easy to swap out the E3D Titan for a Himera. Um, other things I can think of are testing, for example, V6 versus the Slice Engineering Copperhead, or doing different bed surfaces or bed sizes or bed heaters even doing genuine versus cloned parts and trying to push them to the limits. And you know, I can even do uh, testing of different control boards simply because, well, the connectors are all there and there is plenty of space to fit uh, a different board. You know, these connectors are all standardized more or less. That's also something that's pretty hard to test repeatedly on another printer that's a bit more optimized and integrated. But because this is such a modular and I guess simple build. I mean, I could even do testing for, for example, replacing these Z-axis drives and testing lead screws versus these uh, threaded rods or even doing ball screws. And all it takes is replacing these blocks and moving the motor mount. So I'm really happy with the result. Um, of course, it is not perfect yet. There are still a few things to do. For example, I realized these drag chains, um, at least on the X-axis, are actually a bit too short to reach all the way to the minimum point of X. Um, I can figure that out. I can take a few links from this one and add it into this one and then kind of wiggle the cables around. Also, obviously this cable management mess up here uh, can still use some work. And you know, maybe the Y axis would be something that I can rebuild at some time in the future, simply because that's still like the original one with like a 3D printed drag chain and not really the proper cabling in there. But for now this works and, and this is not gonna be a limiting factor. But yeah, overall, I am really happy with how this entire thing turned out. As always, let me know in the comments below what you would like to see tested on this platform. Um, again, nothing is off limits. Every single component can be fitted in here, just like I can fit in a segue to today's sponsor, Skillshare. You proud of me, Linus? Are you looking to get a head start into learning something new or are simply looking for something useful to do with your time? Well, Skillshare is an online learning community, so when you're looking to learn a new skill, you've got a huge number of classes to guide you through that learning process, and they do use the learning by doing principle, where you'll actually get to apply your skill right away. You can take their classes at your own pace, whether that's just squeezing in a single lesson in your lunch break, or simply trying out everything and taking a dozen classes over a couple of days. And if you have questions, you can talk to your classmates and fellow creatives right there on Skillshare. I'm still working on giving my channel a makeover to get away from it just being the My Name channel uh, and having a proper logo and graphics. So I've been taking a bunch of classes on logo design on Skillshare and because I'm a fan of geometric, perfectly arranged shapes, I've really enjoyed the logo designs with grids, timeless style from Simple Shapes course by George Bohua. Of course, they've got courses on pretty much everything from cooking to CAD and if you want to try it out, Skillshare are giving away two free months of premium membership for the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description box below to help you explore your creativity. After that, it's just about 10 bucks a month. Thanks Skillshare! So I hope you learned something out of my struggles with this printer and getting everything working. Um, I hope you enjoyed the process, so thank you for watching. If you want to see more like it, as usual, get subscribed, ring that bell so you don't miss future videos on the stuff I actually do with this printer. If you want to support the channel, you can do so over on Patreon or through YouTube memberships. Uh, that is very much appreciated. And again, thank you for watching, keep on making, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!